Hello, everyone. My name is Margarita Hli, and I'm leading the Vision for Robotics Lab of ETH Zurich. Now, this talk is about our work on vision-based robotic perception for perceptive locomotion. Um, the inspiration for our work comes from nature. A lot of it actually comes from nature. And I wanted to show you two examples. So here you're looking at an eagle that is spotting um, a salmon through water and is able to plan its path such that it can successfully grasp it while they're both in motion. Then uh, I want to also show you this video here where you can see this flock of starlings. It's flying in seemingly perfect unison. Uh, so the, uh, the birds are flying seemingly in perfect unison, creating these beautiful formations and without crashing into each other. So the question here is, um, looking at these examples, what kind of robotic perception do we need to build into our robots in order to have them um, navigating and interacting with, with us and with our scene around us? Uh, so I've taken this big problem and I've split it into three distinct challenges that we would have to address to make this happen. So first and foremost, we need to have high fidelity ego motion and scene estimation built into our robots. This promises to build the backbone of the awareness of space for a robot. Then on top of this, we need um, to be able to have scene reconstruction, such that there's more awareness of a robot, of its surroundings, uh, in order to interact with the surroundings and perform also path planning. And the third challenge is once we have robots that they are able to address challenge one and two, um, how can we have multiple of such intelligent agents interacting with each other with the environment to collaborate um, in order to perform a common task together more effectively, more efficiently, more accurately? So uh, basically, these challenges also represent the three main research streams in my lab. I'm going to go through them and I'm going to show you um, a bit of a taste of what we do in each of them. So firstly, let's look at um, high fidelity um, ego motion and scene estimation, which is basically high fidelity SLAM for simultaneous localization and mapping. I'm sure um, uh, most of you have heard of the, this slang. Now, um, here is a video back from 2012 where we showed for the first time that it is uh, possible to um, automate the flight of a small aircraft like this one that you see here, using cues from a single camera that is looking downwards and um, inertial measurements uh, from onboard the drone. So here you're looking at the kind of map that um, we were building and the, the poses of the, um, uh, the estimated poses of um, the camera and hence the aircraft. And um, of course, when you see a video like this, um, all roboticists know that um, it, it has taken quite some time to, to make this happen. And even to run a demo like this, we had to go um, two days in advance on the site. But uh, so there's, there's a lot um, that um, happens under the hood of what we call autonomous navigation that as you can see here, this autonomous flight. But I wanted to show you um, one particular challenge that is um, an ongoing problem, an open problem in SLAM. So here is my student. She's walking down um, Shopping Street, um, almost pedestrian street here in Zurich. Uh, she's holding this time um, a sensor head. So you're looking at the view from the camera and on the bottom you can see the um, SLAM trajectory and the SLAM map that is being built on the go. Now she's walking down one side of the street and coming back up the other side of the street. And basically these two locations should have corresponded to exactly the same place. And the point of this video is to show you the drift that inevitably occurs when, even if you have the best slam system in the world, it is bound to drift unless you're running some background thread that I'm going to explain to you about, or you have some global um, uh, measurements like GPS. So in this case, we're trying to be generic and use only the local uh, onboard sensor, so vision and inertial. So in cases like this, in the, in the, in the literature, we need to run uh, instances of place recognition to really um, 
trigger uh, processes for the robots to recognize where it's going back to a location where it has been to before. So in order to address this, um, in the community, we um, basically built a vocabulary of visual words um, and we search for matching images in the rest of the trajectory. So we search for matching images to the current image in a very similar way that Google um, searches for images in its database. Now, when you're experiencing the world with a camera uh, and you want to address this problem of have I been to this place before, then you have some problems like this one here where you can see that different places can appear, appear identical. The same place can appear different between visits. And that's even more the case when you consider uh, a timeline throughout the year, so different seasons, or even throughout the day and night, right? So we have very different views um, uh, in daytime and in nighttime. And on top of this, we also have an additional challenge uh, that is often overlooked. And it's especially the case when you are viewing the, the same place or, well, the scene using a drone. And that's a challenge of different viewpoints. So um, all of these three, well, these three images here on the bottom, they represent the same place, but they look very different. So how can we make our system recognize that it's coming back to the same location? So let me focus a little bit on this challenge here on viewpoint tolerance. So here is results from um, our system where uh, we're going back to the same location. You can see the trajectory now being plotted in blue. Uh, we're going back to the same location six months later and we're trying to run place recognition. Now our system here is employing not only visual cues but also geometric cues in order to give us some of this viewpoint tolerance. So we're keeping local instances of the SLAM map to not only give us appearance matches but also geometric matches okay so you can see that now um you know all of these um green lines that you see appearing between the red and the blue trajectories they correspond to loop closures we are not able to close all of the loops but we are doing much much better than um, we were doing just using appearance only um data and of course we can go on and have a look at some of the real data but um i wanted to show you this work here where we are taking this a step further we're trying to push the boundaries of viewpoint tolerance and in order to do that in order to quantify viewpoint tolerance we had to go for uh simulated data sets to make sure that we are able to quantify um whether we are viewing the same scene and from what viewpoint. So here you can see the different viewpoints that we are looking at. And we start with this um, planar scene, the Lagu data set. And um, we are um, trying to match the current trajectory that you'll see it in a second, um, starting being estimated in blue against the reference trajectory there in, in red. So here you're looking results with a 45 degree difference. So looking at the images on the top, you can see really how different these images are. And here are some results in a more three dimensional uh, model where we want to show that we, um, uh, we can go closer to real scenes um, to, to address this uh, so big um, viewpoint uh, change. And actually, we are able to show that we have um, uh, much better recall and precision characteristics than the state of the art because we're using the SLAM map and uh, depth completion techniques to, to address um, this question of is this place the same as something that I have seen in my trajectory before? Uh, and something that, well, I need to touch upon, of course, because we didn't address it so far, is the changes in illumination and in seasons. And for these, um, for these changes, for the moment, the in my lab and also in general in the um, in the community, we are resorting to deep learning. So here you're looking at results um, uh, of our uh, convolutional neural network that it was trained from February images and from June images of the same locations. And so the CNN has learned what makes a place distinctive with respect to other places and what changes in the scene are transient and should not be taken into account when the robot is deciding whether 
um, it is in the presence of the same location or not. So things like um, uh, snow, for example, it's uh, learning to suppress this information because sometimes it's snowy and sometimes it's greenery, such as in these examples here, um, so that we are able to uh, come up with such returns for these query images. Um, so to conclude a little bit uh, of this first section on high fidelity slam, if you remember the challenge number one that we're looking at. So we've been experimenting with different sensors. I, I haven't really talked about it, but I wanted to show you a flavor basically of what we do. Um, sensor fusion, deep learning, place recognition, just to form this awareness of space for a robot in order to basically come up with a robot um, pose and a map of its surroundings. Now, the key word here is that this map has so far been quite sparse, which brings me to the second challenge where we want our robots to uh, come up with a denser scene representation such that they can reach out and grasp an object or to avoid obstacles, for example, while flying or while walking, if you're using a walking robot. Uh, so here you're looking at results from um, uh, densifying um, the, the robot surroundings, the camera surroundings. So we have one camera on board this drone. And in red, you can see the laser point cloud that we're using there as uh, ground truth to compare against the grayscale um, uh, dense map that you're looking at, which has been captured using camera. And here again, we're using learning techniques to uh, basically slam in, co in combination with the learning technique to um, come up with a densified um, representation of the scene. Of course, it doesn't really work very well in uh, uh, looking through windows, right? So we have specularities and we have things like this that vision by its own is not uh, working very well. But um, it's also important to be able to push the boundaries of what we can do with one sensor only before we are we start considering fusing it with with other sensors. So here you can see what we can do with one camera. And it is with maps like this that we can then start talking about autonomous navigation. So here you're looking at a drone now, this is a really fast um, outside view. And the, the pilot is following the drone, but um, the you're looking at um, the immediate path that the drone is planning for itself. So I have to say it's taking off and knows nothing about the scene, but we are giving it a goal position, which is on the right hand side at the end of the at outside my slide, right at the right hand side. And, and this goal position acts like a magnet. So this drone always wants to reach that goal in the fastest um, time possible, fastest path possible, right? But as it starts to try trying to go towards that goal, it starts experiencing more and more of the scene. Uh, and you can see this being carved out, right? With this dense reconstruction. So it's trying to then avoid these obstacles on the fly. So that's why it's replanning its path on, on the go, right? Right, and um, to go to the last challenge here, um, I wanted to show you this video where um, we demonstrated for the first time three drones um, running SLAM independently, right, uh, on each drone. They are uh, then communicating with a central server. Here we are using a standard laptop, but it could be the cloud, for example. Why? Because we, you know, after some time navigating through space, each drone that is uh, running its own board um, monocular SLAM, single camera SLAM, um, it needs to start forgetting about these experiences in order to be able to process new frames in real time. So before forgetting, we are actually telling this drone, try and send all this information to the server. Uh, and then the server is collecting all of this information from different participants in the team here, drones, right? And it's running all the um, luxury, if you'd like, uh, processes like um, map merging, saying, oh, you know what? Here is some place recognition instances. So this drone and this drone have been to the same place before, actually, I have experienced an overlap in their trajectory. So let me merge them, optimize this map, and inform any participating agents about any changes that have occurred in, in their local surroundings. And what does that mean? It means that um, we no longer need to address 
every agent individually, right? And we can actually share experiences via this central server. So um, we can experience overlap between trajectories or an, a drone goes to a place where someone else has been to before, right? So it doesn't have to start mapping from scratch. Um, so in this occasion here, we're using Wi-Fi. So what does that mean? It means that if, um, if the connection doesn't work well, then we have no collaboration, but we have we can ensure the integrity of uh, the SLAM process, the processes on board each robot. So worst case scenario, they behave as individuals, but best case scenario, they share information, they share map points, they share experiences of these map points from different viewpoints, right? Uh, from the different agents. So they're collaboratively building a common map of their environment. And we have taken um, similar uh, architecture and extended it to, to using visual and inertial information and ported it also on different platforms. So here you're looking at a drone that is carrying a visual inertial sensor and animals. So this is um, a walking robot that is carrying also visual inertial sensor. Each robot it by themselves, they are running visual inertial slam and they um, uh, collaborate via sending information down a desktop computer there in the background to share information. So this, uh, what we call CVI SLAM for Collaborative Visual Inertia SLAM, uses the same basically architecture and communication protocol with um, work that we've seen before. But um, of course, we have now metric scale, which enables autonom uh, autonomy, gravity alignment, and we have, of course, information in between camera frames from the inertial sensor. So let me share with you some results um, just to convince you, hopefully, if you're not convinced that collaboration can make a real difference. So when we are so we are taking now um, benchmarking data sets, so these are the Europe data sets, and we are running them as if they've been, uh, so we have these MH sequences, okay, one to five, and we are running pairs of them, um, simulating, um, simulating two uh, drones flying in the same space, basically, because we want to show uh, the root mean square error on this sequence of these benchmarking sequences when we're treating agents individually. So when we're doing that, when we're treating agents individually, when we're treating sequences individually, these are the kind of errors that we get. But when we are actually treating them in collaboration to each other, right, as if that they're as if they are both um, being captured at the same time, then you can see that the, this exchange of information at runtime uh, improves accuracy not only after the mission, so not only when the drones land and take all the information and bundle adjust it, but also during the mission, they have access to more information than them, their own. So that means that uh, through this collaborative scheme, they can have much better accuracy during the mission as well. And um, just to also open up uh, now the, the um, uh, zoom out and open up the, the applications that can be possible uh, to show you the challenges, but of course opportunities multiply. Um, of course, we are addressing robotic collaboration, robot to robot collaboration, but also one can start considering human to robot collaboration with schemes like this, being able to co-localize in the same space, right? And it is with these three challenges that we are aiming to teach robots to see and collaborate, because um, we believe that these are um, key um, skills in order to boost uh, robotic autonomy, what ro robots can do today in terms of their autonomy. And I did spend a lot of this talk and a lot of these videos talking about drones uh, because they pose some of the most difficult challenges for robotic perception, but we are working also with other platforms. And I want to show you here a little bit the breadth and depth of, of well, breadth mostly, of um, uh, different applications. And in fact, we are working with uh, Swiss Railway, 
to automate train navigation. Um, we had a project with Huawei for multiplayer mapping for gaming. Of course, um, navigation with uh, multiple drones such that we're able to map things like radiation. Um, and just to show you, I wanted to conclude, basically I wanted to show you uh, one example where I think it's quite cool to, to look at. This is a collaboration between roboticists and um, so two robotics labs here at um, ETH, uh, Robotic Systems Lab and my lab, Vision for Robotics Lab, uh, together together with uh, Gramazio and Kohler um, uh, lab uh, in architecture. And um, we collaborated together to um, basically build such a wall out of locally sourced stones. So we have um, about 100 uh, pieces here. They weigh about uh, a ton each. And we're using this autonomous excavator. So if you see closely, there's no driver there. Uh, and what is happening is that we are scanning the environment. We are segmenting out these stones and we are able to uh, plan how to grasp them using the, uh, the robotic excavator in order to then um, start visualizing inside a physics simulator on how to place this, um, this stone such that we can build a freestanding wall, which is what you can see here. Of course, it's not the nicest wall you might have seen, but I think it's pretty impressive to see what um, uh, we can do with robotic perception and um, of course, uh, the, the whole pipeline there. So with this, I would like to conclude. Um, this is my team, uh, of course, um, which I, I thank them, but also thank you for your attention.